Sean Spicer, incoming White House press secretary. How are you preparing to, to brief behind the podium and to take on this job? Uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, we've been doing a, month, a daily call at 1030 every day, which is you get to hide behind a phone when you do it. Uh, but part of it is getting used to the battle rhythm of taking those questions, the rapid fire, and the, and the, the wide range that exists. I'll do some practice sessions. One of the things that my predecessors have suggested is to sit down at a podium and let, you know, pretend reporters ask you real questions to try to make sure you understand the depth and breadth of what's about to come your way on a daily basis. But um, it's making sure you get up to speed on some key hot button issues, um, sit down with some of the key players who will be playing key roles in the administration to develop those relationships to get a better understanding of the issues. And then also just getting used to the, the battle rhythm of taking the questions in the way that they do at the podium. You talked to Josh Ernest, the, the current White House press secretary. Any advice, anything that you took away from that conversation and also touring his office in the briefing room in the West Wing? Yeah, I, Josh and Jen Psaki, the communications director, were unbelievably generous uh, with both their time and their counsel. They shared with me some of the challenges that they face and um, some of the ideas that they had. And, and a lot of it, frankly, was just me asking questions about procedurally what they have found works better than other in terms of timing, preparation, things like that. Um, it's been eight years since I've been in, in the White House. And, uh, and so it was an opportunity to really reacquaint myself with the size and scope of the offices, how many people really sit in, in the different areas uh, that deal with the press. That was very helpful as far as the planning piece of this going. But I would say that beyond Josh and Jen, you know, whether it's you know Ari Fleischer, Dana Perino, Robert Gibbs, Jake Carney, um, even Marlon Fitzwater going back, everybody who's held this job has gone back, has reached out uh, and offered their advice and their counsel. And it's, um, it's a pretty humbling experience when you realize that you're in a club of 30 um, people who've held this position. The biggest change from eight years ago, social media. Right. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So how does that add to the challenge for you trying to communicate a message yeah, by the I White actually, House? The, the interesting thing is I look at it as an opportunity, not a challenge. When we left, the Bush administration left in 2009, there was no at press sec, there was no at POTUS, uh, there was no Facebook page, there was no Instagram. I think we go in both with the government um, assets that exist, but obviously Donald Trump's own Twitter handle, his Facebook and his Instagram, we're talking about 50 million people following, 19 a million alone on Twitter. That's a pretty powerful tool. And that's why I said it's an opportunity, because I think when you realize it's one thing just to be able to tweet, the power and the movement that he represents is a tool that nobody's ever had before to be able to reach people in such a unique way. Having spent time at the White House, you know how close the quarters are. Yeah. How is that going to affect your interaction with West Wing staffers and Well, I think we're, I mean, here at Trump Tower, uh, it's a pretty, you know, uh, close-knit group. Everyone knows each other really well, works side by side with each other. And I think that atmosphere is going to continue in the West Wing. You grew up in Rhode Island? I did. Do you remember when you first got interested in politics? Yeah. Uh, was, uh, my seniorish year of school, junior senior, was a guy named Cliff Hobbins. He's our, still there phenomenal guy, really inspired not just me, but a lot of students, and some people have gone on to do really important things, uh, to get involved and to understand the awesomeness of politics, the battle, the back and forth of ideas and campaigning. Um, and so I, I toiled a little in college, putting up signs, I mean, in high school. And then I went to college uh, my sophomore year. I really got in, started taking classes and getting involved. I volunteered on the congressional race at the time. I, my junior year, I volunteered at the Connecticut State Legislature. Um, so it was that kind of four or five years that I really got an interest in politics uh, beyond the theory and, and really went into the practice of it by getting out in the field and helping out. But let me go back to that high school teacher. What, what was it about him? What did he say? What did I think he it's like you? a lot of teachers. It's, it's not the material. It's the passion that they have for it. And the, the ability to share that and inspire people and motivate you. And so different people have different things. Some people, you know, find math or a particular language. I think in this particular case, I really enjoyed the way he presented politics. Um, the campaigning, the back and forth, the idea of crafting and drafting and implementing a message. It just was something that appealed to me. So that's how you got involved in politics. Why Republican Party politics? That's a great question. And, uh, 
a state like Rhode Island, which has done fairly well with Republicans. We've got some great mayors. We've had some, um, we've had some good governors, and we've had some success at the federal level. Uh, but I think part of it was um, my father had a very strong uh, business sense, um, talking about regulatory aspects of taxes and how they affected the ability to do business and create jobs. Um, I remember they instituted the luxury tax in Rhode Island. We're the ocean state. Uh, sailing and yachting and boat building are crucial to Rhode Island's you know, manufacturing base and job creation. They passed the luxury tax, which was aimed to raise money from rich people. And it was all the little people who sold boats, who cleaned boats, who moved boats, that lost their job. And the base left Rhode Island and moved. And we used to be uh, sort of a destination for boat building and boat manufacturing. And that all went away. And people just started buying used boats or moving them to different places. And you know, I think watching things like that happen on an economic front and how it affects job creation really got me uh, going. And then, obviously, uh, from a social perspective, uh, I, I grew up uh, really believing in a, in a pro-life, pro-family uh, agenda. And I think the Republican Party and conservative values much more fit my, ideology, my, my personality. Brothers, sisters, one of each, both younger. And what do they think about uh, what their brother's doing? Uh, there's different parts of it. I think they're very proud um, of me um, and what I've done and where I'm going to work. Um, to some degree or another, sometimes they disagree on a particular issue or something I said or something that, that is in the Republican Party platform or whatever. And, and so they're much less politically driven, but I think they're, they're both very proud of the work that I've done and where I've ended up. So a lot of debate maybe over a Thanksgiving thanks, or Christmas dinner. Well, it's not dinner. just Thanksgiving. <laughs> Most dinners end up with some kind of political discussion or issue discussion. Let me ask you about your experience at Capitol Hill. You yeah. worked for the House Budget Committee. How will you apply that to the White House job? Well, I work, um, I've worked in the Senate and the House. I think somewhere close to 11 different members of Congress, House and Senate, uh, maybe 10. Uh, but I think understanding two things, the issues, whether it's the House Budget Committee, I worked the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, House Government Reform Committee, Senate House Republican Conference, uh, and various rank and file members. So there's two things that I think are important. One is the issues that were in front of those committees and the understanding um, that I now have because of the opportunity that was afforded me there, but also the process and the way it works. And one of the things that I think is important about Washington is, you know, as they say, understanding how the sausage is made and understanding how an agenda is driven and how it's implemented successfully. So knowing the committee process, knowing the leadership, knowing rank and file and how they operate, um, I think helps uh, build a narrative and drive a, a successful agenda that the president-elect is putting forward.